Hey everyone, Mike here. Welcome back to the channel. Here at the Guitar Bar, we deal almost exclusively with a variety of used and vintage guitar gear, especially Fender. As you might imagine, thoroughly vetting vintage Fender amps for originality and optimal functionality is an everyday job for us, whether when we're listing gear for sale or customer amps passing through our service department. Today, we're gonna show you how we go about dating a vintage Fender amp. We're gonna be breaking down the source date codes on the potentiometers, speakers, and transformers, as well as decrypting the dates on tube charts. Now, it's important we put some brackets on today's conversation, as the information in this video is going to be largely applicable to Fender amps produced from 1948 to 1981. Much of what we'll be discussing here will be applicable beyond this state range, but the main focus is the amps that fall into the tweed, brown panel, black panel, and silver panel eras of production. On the bench, we have a willing volunteer, a 1964 Fender Deluxe Reverb from production run number one. It's a legendary circuit and perfect for today's purposes. But how do we know for sure that this is a 1964 Fender Deluxe Reverb. The first thing we'll look at to get a rough idea of an amp's age are the cosmetics, or the outward appearance of the amp. We'll take it all in, from knobs to Tolex, faceplate cosmetics and grill cloth, and we'll compare these features against what we know to be era correct for this model. The first thing we'll look at is the Tolex and the grill cloth. Now, we know black Tolex was first introduced in late 1963, as was silver sparkle grill cloth, so those both check out for this amp. Let's take an even closer look at this grill cloth. Do we know that it's original? Well, the weave on this grill cloth is actually fractionally wider than what we'd see on a 1960s fender, but the cloth has been aged to more closely match the patina on the original Tolex. A couple additional small features that will be germane to a pre-CBS era Fender Deluxe Reverb from 1963 to 64 will be the lack of a logo on the grill cloth, as well as the way that the silkscreen text is presented below the Deluxe Reverb name. You'll see that this text says Fender Electric Instrument Company. Now, this would be only for the amps produced very early in the Deluxe Reverb's production run. CBS Corporation would buy Fender in January of 1965, and they would change this text to say Fender Musical Instruments. One more tiny little detail that we can look at here that's specific to the black panel era of production are the knobs. Now, we know these are black panel era knobs because of the eight. This little guy here is called a Snowman 8. That's because the top of the eight is just a little bit smaller than the bottom, like a snowman. The cosmetics alone aren't the best way to know if a vintage amp is authentic, but it's important to know how an amp presents and what it claims to be. The main focus of our vetting today will be source date codes. So let's take a minute to discuss what a source date code is and why they exist at all. These codes are an identifying number that when decoded will tell you the manufacturer, the year of production, and the week. These codes work within a framework set up by the Electronic Industries Association, a nonprofit group representing the manufacturers of electronic components. While the EIA first published a list of source date codes in 1924, the process didn't become standardized until after World War II, over two decades later. Source date codes typically have six or seven digits, and they can be found in a number of places on your amp, including on the transformers, on the speaker frames, and on potentiometers. Let's break down the source date code on this Deluxe. Now this speaker here is manufactured by Oxford, Fender's primary supplier of speakers in the black panel era. It's a 12 inch ceramic magnet driver and our source date code is right here. The code for Oxford is 465 and breaking down the year and the week of production of this speaker, we have five for 1965 and 21 for the 21st week within that year. While this particular Oxford is error correct for this amp, you might already be shouting at the screen saying, wait a minute, this speaker's from 1965, but we're talking about an amp from 1964. Well, this is an error correct substitution and actually quite beneficial for the Deluxe as it allows for better wattage handling and a bit bolder low end. In addition to dating a speaker by its source date code, you can also figure out the rough wattage of the speaker by the letter embedded in the speaker's model name. This will hold true for both Oxford's and Jensen's, Fender's two primary speaker suppliers. For Oxford's, as the speaker wattage goes up, so does the letter in the alphabet embedded in the speaker name. For example, 
The 12L5 speaker in this deluxe is higher wattage than a 12K5, which would be the speaker typically found stock in a deluxe reverb. For Oxford, the range of speakers used in Fender's guitar amps extends from the 8E speaker used in the Vibrachamp, an 8-inch driver, the 10J speaker used in the Princeton and Princeton Reverb, a 10-inch driver, and the 12T speakers used in the Bassman and Twin amps, both 12 inches. The letter codes on Jensen speakers work in the opposite direction. The earlier the letter is in the alphabet, the higher wattage the speaker will be. This pattern continues to this day, with Fender using Jensen's C12K speaker in their modern deluxe reverb reissues rated at a whopping 100 watts. Now, the light duty speakers in Jensen's guitar amp range go all the way down to R rated at about 20 watts. It's important to note that these letters reference both the wattage of the speaker and the size of the voice coil. For example, a Jensen C12Q will have a one and a quarter inch voice coil rated at roughly 30 watts, while a Jensen C12R, again at Jensen's low end of their guitar amp range, will have a one inch voice coil. One last handy tip pertinent to Jensen is that the material of the magnet used in the speaker can be deduced by the letter prefix on the model name. C predictably stands in for ceramic magnet, while P is a bit less intuitive, meaning an Alnico magnet speaker. P stands for permanent, as these speakers, when introduced circa 1950, replaced the electromagnet field coil design that Jensen had used previously. To tie this up in the neatest possible bow, it's important to remember that Fender was a big company, especially after CBS took over in 1965. Fender would slap their label on a variety of speaker manufacturers. While Jensen and Oxford are the biggies, Fender used JBL speakers on certain high-end, high-wattage models, and they also use speakers manufactured by Utah and CTS for the Bassman and Super Reverb, respectively. As the silver panel era dragged into the early 80s, Fender would use even more speaker manufacturers, likes of Pile and Electrovoice. The moral of the story here is to check your source date codes and see if they match up with the appropriate era of your amplifier. Now we'll dig into tube charts, and this is an easy one, a total slam dunk. If you can string together two letters of the alphabet, you can date any Fender tube chart from 1953 to 1967. While Fender's Tweed amps began production in 1948, they didn't standardize tube chart dating until 1953. Now the first letter of the two letter code will stand for the year of production and the second letter for the month. For example, a Tweed Fender that left the factory in January of 1953 would have a CA date code. On our Deluxe Reverb, the code reads NA. Now that's N standing in for 1964 and A again for January. Fender would abandon this practice at the end of the black panel era, but it's an extremely handy data point for the Tweed, Brown, and black panel eras of production. Shifting the focus to the circuit itself, let's take apart the amp and take a look at the transformers. The Fender amps are very easy to take apart. All we have to do here is take the four screws off the back panel and then the four nuts connected by these two chassis straps. Hey everybody. <laughs> Transformers are these big old blocks extending below the chassis of the amp. Now you'll often hear the output transformer referred to as the heart of the circuit and it's the centrally located one here. The power transformer is the largest of the bunch, located at the far end of the chassis. Fender used two primary transformer suppliers for the vintage amps, Triad and Schumacher. Schumacher was what we have here, and these were introduced on Fender amps around 1959. Coming in a distant third is Better Coil and Transformer, and their transformers were seen almost exclusively on the black panel era of production. Triads are the outlier here in terms of dating, as their ink stamps on the transformer bells are not datable. Thankfully, there's enough reference photography out there for the Tweed era of production that we can discern if a transformer is original or not. Schumacher and Better Coil and Transformer use a standard six-digit source code on the transformer bells, breaking down to three digits for the manufacturer, one digit for the year, and two digits for the week of production. Let's look at the output transformer on our Deluxe. Now, its code begins with 606, the identifying number for Schumacher, followed by three for the year of production, and 50 for the 50th week within that year. Better Coil and Transformer follow this exact same pattern. Theirs begin with 831 instead of Schumacher's 606. What's worth pointing out here is while our Deluxe Reverb dates to 1964, all of the Transformers date to 1963. 
A transformer code, like a pot code or a tube chart date, will represent the earliest year, month, week a component could be produced. You need to look at all of the available data on every code of the amp to really figure out the year the amp was made. And as the year is represented by a single digit in the transformer code, say three for our 1963 transformer, that could actually represent either 1963 or 1973, so be careful. Inside the chassis are our last pertinent date codes, but first, a word of warning. One should always exercise necessary caution when pulling a chassis because there is the potential for high voltage. For potentiometers or pots, Fender once again used two primary suppliers, Stackpole and CTS. It's common to find pots from both suppliers within the same amp, as is the case with our deluxe reverb here. There's typically a range of a few months between the codes of any pots in an amplifier as well, as they were produced in large batches. Now, the lone CTS pot in our amplifier is the bias pot here. CTS's source state codes begin with 137. Every other pot in our chassis here is manufactured by Stackpole. Their source state codes begin with 304. Just like transformers, the next digit or digits will represent the year, and the following two digits the week within that year. The visible date on our Stackpole pot is seven digits in length, with 304 for Stackpole, 63 for the year of production, and 18 for the 18th week within that year. These dates can be found in two places, either on the back of the pot or on the side. Now to get a peek at those side codes, you'll often have to remove the knob and the nut and gently pull the pot back from the circuit. For brown and black panel amps, Fender also put a stamp inside the chassis, and the last two digits of this stamp will reference the year of production. In this case, 6-4 for 1964. Fender was relatively inconsistent with how the chassis stamps were applied, and some stamp-happy Fender employees would liberally apply this stamp on multiple components inside the chassis. We've seen these chassis stamps used on each individual filter cap, on transformer bells, and even on the inside edge of tilt-back legs. It's important to look at every available code, date, and cosmetic feature of your amp to date it appropriately. These codes can typically span a number of months, but will rarely extend beyond a full year. And while an amp may have dates spanning, say, 1963 and 1964, as with our Deluxe here, the latest date will always signify the year of production. Thank you for sticking with us through this spec-heavy journey. For all of the vintage Fender amps we have here at the Guitar Bar, as well as all of the repair and restoration services we offer, please check out mmguitarbar.com and stay tuned for more content.